uh, the regulations that are coming uh, into force, that were just published uh, end of last year, uh, will uh, very strongly impact this region as well. And this is because the issues that we're talking about uh, are universal, right? We know that the built environment is responsible, for, you know, depending on the country, depending on, on the region, uh, between 30 to 40 percent of both uh, uh, energy consumption and carbon emissions. So, of course, you know, if any country wants to achieve that Paris alignment, that, that sort of pie in the sky, they will have to deal with, um, with the building uh, environment. And, and what we need to deal with, of course, most than anything, is existing buildings, right? So we can't build ourselves out of climate change. Of course, we do um, uh, need new buildings, especially housing, but we need to deal with the existing uh, building stocks. So I work for an asset manager. I've been in um, a sustainable real estate investment for a while um, and pension funds own the world, right? So they invest in real estate and they have to comply with these regulations and they will need to implement this throughout uh, their portfolios um, uh, throughout Europe and, and, and the world, right? So uh, it, it's quite important for us um, and, and it, it will become important for, for the region if they want to attract uh, institutional capital to invest uh, uh, in the region. So what are we talking about? Uh, from, an, from an investor point of view, we will need to manage risks. Asset managers need to prove to the investors, to the pension funds that are giving their money, or us their money to invest, that we are managing the risks from climate change, right? So it, it is a little bit carbon uh, focused. I will be talking about a broader topic of holistic sustainability later on real estate, which is also important for the investment. But first and foremost, we need to manage risks. And it, it, we are talking here about two pronged, uh, if you like, uh, uh, depending on, it's between a rock and a hard place, right? If we go into green transition really, really fast, we are facing higher transitional risks. And that means that the regulation requirements and energy efficiency of the buildings are going to be higher. And therefore, uh, if you have an energy inefficient building, you can get a stranded asset faster. So from an investment point of view, this is a big risk, right? It's good to transition, it's good to transition fast, but if you have a large portfolio of 100 buildings that are not performing very well, this is a, a big, big stranding risk uh, for your portfolio. We have a regulation in UK um, called minimum energy efficiency standards, which required minimum energy efficiency standards, right, MIS, uh, for buildings to be legally rented. So if you hold a portfolio of 100 buildings, you can't rent them, uh, you have a big problem on your hands. On the other hand, if we don't move really fast, we again have assets trending, but this time because climate change is going to hit us really hard. And we're already seeing this uh, from fires, from you know, Dubai flooding and Texas being snowed under, you know, freak uh, weather events are all over the place. So we need to prove, we need to make these buildings resilient. Uh, we need to keep the buildings doing what they're supposed to do and provide shelter, right? We sometimes forget what the buildings are about. They're, they're about providing shelter to humans, right? So they need to perform much better than they used to. They need to be much more resilient than they used to be. So what are we looking at in, in our region? You know, so we know about earthquakes, we know about the floods, um, we know about the heat waves, we know about um, uh, uh, wildfires. They're all going to get more severe. So our buildings in our region not only if we want to attract investment, but also if we want to be safe, need to be resilient uh, to these impacts. Looking at the transitional risk, I will rush through. So these are the physical risks, the transitional risk. Uh, well, you know, Croatia and Slovenia will need to be compliant immediately. But also in, in Montenegro, if you want uh, foreign investment, you will need to prove to them that you're compliant with this kind of performance. And for the first time, um, uh, EPBD or European uh, 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 Performance of Buildings Directive in the previous version only looked at the new construction. What it is dealing now there is the minimum energy efficiency performance you see there in the existing, uh, for the existing buildings and that is where most of the action will need to happen and this is what we're talking about uh, in the panel today. So um, that is one piece that we were talking about. So how do we improve uh, buildings, but also uh, the whole life cycle carbon. Uh, I'm not going to explain everything now. I'll, I'll leave it to my uh, very knowledgeable panel to explain what is that, but that is also going to be uh, interesting and crucial. It's not only about operational carbon in the buildings, 
but also uh, what is in the, in the materials that go in them, right? So last, uh, we do have some regulations already in the region. They're starting to align um, with EPBD. So um, from recommendations to becoming mandatory, there's a very small step or expected, if you like, from the investor point of view. So the, the, in, in my world, there's a lot of voluntary reporting or voluntary standards that for us, if we want to get a ticket for the investment, it's mandatory in real, in real world, right? So the, for the building industry, in this region, these things are actually uh, going to be a must. So with that, I would like to invite my panel, please. So uh, first, Milena Stojkovic, she is an architect at Foster & Partners. Welcome. Yasmin Mahmoudi, she has her own practice and also an architect. I promise I was not overly uh, biased when I was choosing, uh, but also an ex-architect, but also an economist, Jim Coleman from WSP. Um, let's start with, um, with the boring part, the energy performance of the buildings. Uh, we're gonna have to fix everything that we have pretty much. Um, the European uh, Commission pulled back a little bit from prescribing specific standards in terms of energy performance certificate, but they still said, well, you know, 16% uh, of the lowest performing residential buildings need to be fixed, 26% of non-residential stock, we're looking at 2033. It's not a very long time when we talk about built environment. So, Jim, what do you think this will do to real estate industry? Um, yes, thank you for the, uh, the question, Sasha, and uh, thank you for inviting me to take part in, this, uh, in the whole event, actually, um, yesterday and today. Um, I think there are quite a lot of different dynamics at play with regard to this question, and I think one is about the regulation itself. Um, we had a, a lot of discussion yesterday about regulation in the context of energy markets. Uh, re regulation is supposed to change our behavior. It's supposed to change what we do. And obviously we're looking at having more sustainable buildings, greener buildings, more sustainable environments through having better buildings. So the regulation should be designed to do that, but it is all about the design of the regulation. And of course, regulation is supposed to deal with market failure, but we also get regulatory failure. And that's partly about the design and it's partly about the enforcement and how systematic, I mean, how strongly the regulation is enforced, how systematic, how consistent it's done. And there will be building owners and developers out there who will try to circumvent the regulation if they can. So I think there's a whole thing about just the design and the actual enforcement of the regulation and making sure that it is, is doing the, getting people to do the right thing in the right context. I think that's important. Um, I think with refurbishment, retrofitting, improving efficiency, new energy systems, insulation, whatever it might be. I mean, inevitably, for a lot of building owners, of course, it comes at a cost. There's a cost implication. And if you're an investor in a single building or in a portfolio, you're going to make this, you know, this calculation, this cost-benefit calculation in order to decide whether you're actually going to do something. And I think one of the big kind of difficult implications of these kinds of regulations is where that cost benefit calculation is not very positive. What happens to the building? The building maybe just gets taken out of use altogether or is disposed of. We're seeing quite a lot of um, issues in the private rented residential market in the UK, for example, where there are private rented buildings just coming out of the market, mainly because of interest rates. It's just becoming too expensive. And where you have a housing crisis, you do not want residential dwellings coming out of the market. It's a big problem. So I think there are things that, that we need to, to look at there. I mean, there are benefits, of course, because greener buildings are more efficient. Um, they're more attractive to a lot of different types of users. It depends on the type of building. Um, and of course, the, the running costs over time will, will be reduced. Um, so there's a, there's a cost saving um, if, you know, if things are done properly and you know, will make the building more attractive and the investment um, more attractive. But there are lots of contextual drivers. So I think location is a huge driver for decision making in this kind of area. There are places, there are locations within cities, within large urban areas where the values are sufficiently high that making all of these investments, adhering to the regulations, will generate a high return because you're in the right location, you have the right kind of building, 
you attract the right occupier who will pay a premium to be in a building with these characteristics because it suits them. So maybe it suits them operationally, but it suits their brand also as an occupier. And of course, it's going to vary from building to building. If we're talking about commercial buildings, if we're talking about residential buildings, if we're talking about mix of uses, a lot of implications for heritage buildings. I think particularly as well, and a lot of sensitivities around that. Lots of other things which we'll pick up later on. There I think. is a little bit of a um, getaway clause for historical buildings mm, uh, yes, in the yes, regulation, correct. which is nice to see. Because of course, you can't do whatever you want. Uh, um, I had to. Um, I renovated my flat in London. It's not listed, um, but I used um, I had to use aerogel insulation, and if you don't know what it is, it goes into the spacesuits. And it cost it like I was launching a rocket. Um, it, it's unbelievable. So, you know, who pays? You know, cost mm -hmm. and It's okay, I know. In the next 40 years, it might pay back. This was really to, to comply with regulations of building control. It said, well, you need to achieve a certain va in value of you know, installation of the wall. Um, and I didn't want to lose uh, all of my living room. Uh, so, I think installation is going to with that. But not everybody can, can do that. Um, what you were talking about the location of the building, this is yeah, the payback period in prime offices in London, I'm sure yep. it can go all the way out. Yep. But you know, mm. are you talking about cities yesterday yep. and, and you know the locations in the future and you know uh, more so came in, Dublin mm. came in. Mm. You know, do you think that cities in, in the region mm. are going to be able to sustain that kind of investment and mm. payback that mm. we don't have to see? Well, I think this is part of a, a kind of broader strategy. Um, we've just been talking about young people and bringing people back to the cities of the region through having the right kind of offer, whether it's an employment offer or a quality of life offer, or just wanting to be here, having the cities be desirable places. And this will influence values in these places if they are desirable and people are coming back to set up you know, tech businesses and creative industries. So whether the cities in the region can adapt to these things is part of a, a kind of a bigger kind of picture, a bigger environment about how urban areas are changing and how they are attractive on multiple levels and across multiple factors to different types of users. I mean, where we are right now, you could see you know, TVAT becoming a place for you know, high-end professionals in technology who want to be based in somewhere that's yeah. just really attractive, where the quality of life is good, and this is going to raise values in TVAT. So maybe you know, implementing green technologies in buildings suddenly becomes much more viable. But it's part of a broader repositioning of place, I think. And you need, to, you need a kind of holistic strategy um, to, to recognize and realize these things. And, and revive space. So talking yeah. about I'm going to drop a really big elephant on the land here. So we are in a region where we have a lot of so-called green buildings. Huge developments, concrete, you know, uh, uh, skyscrapers, you know, the anthills you know, for living, uh, they're, they're called sometimes. So they have many issues historically about you know, the sense of place that, that James is talking about and, and the value, but also now they will have an issue with energy efficiency and how, how resilient they are for the future. Um, so, from, from your point of view as an uh, architect and you're working for a large company, um, what do you see? What, 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 what are the solutions in such a problematic situation? Yeah, um, I mean, if, if we look at the context um, in in our region, I would say, um, depending on, on place to place, thirty to forty percent of housing was actually built um, in between sixties and eighties. Um, and if you think about it, the first uh, like regulations that talk about thermal performance were introduced in the 60s and then actually implemented for the first time in the 80s. We have a large stock of buildings that don't really perform as well. Um, and then, it's a, again, it's about strategy. You know, how much do you want? Does it make sense to refurbish them? And then how much do you want to refurbish them? Do you just want to do, you know, whatever, whatever is like kind of make sense financially or do you want to do um, exemplary performance there are you know there are options um, to do in a, even like passive house level of refurbishment mm -hmm. which, which is the highest level of insulation uh, so energy fit refurbishment and then you know your heating demand will be like 25 kilowatt hours per square meter and some of those houses are actually 
170, uh, the, the ones from 60s are like 170 kilowatt hours, so going down to 25, there are huge opportunities for savings. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a bigger question of what you want to do. As an architect, I mean, I would always say you need to think how you're actually going to do these things because some of that housing are actually the best examples of Yugoslav architecture. So some are actually masterpieces. And uh, you need to think of how you refurbish and you shouldn't just put whatever, aluminum windows. You know? uh, think what kind of win window frames they had, you know, how do these buildings perform? And then innovation comes in as well. A lot of those buildings were using different innovations at the time like they were prefabricated and so on. So maybe we can come back with new prefabricated facades that look the same, um, same as in England. You know, are we prote is the facade protected? Should it be protected? Are we going internal insulation, external? And then how thick the insulation is because you're going to lose if it's internal. As you said, you're losing square meters of an apartment and that, that has a high value. So then you go into more expensive uh, solutions, but there are solutions to everything. So again, it points out that we all need to work together to establish, you know, what makes sense, what's the strategy, uh, what are the, where are the funding's coming from, mm -hmm. you know, are there grants? There are definitely examples. I mean, NRFIT has been done um, in the UK on very large scale or, or for, on post for housing. Um, there are so many examples even closer by, Austria. So it can be done. We just, uh, you know, need initiatives to, to, to address this. And these examples, are they supported by the government or are they fully private um, projects? Um, I mean, most of them were, uh, were using funding. Um, I mean, the, for example, the one in, in Portsmouth was using, I think, an airfit, uh, so Passive House funding. It was part of a EU project. So it, it was not, it, it was not the, the residents were not funding it. It, it was kind of public. But yeah, we were, we were talking also in Bulgaria, they were, they were doing things, but there's like, so there is some EU funding, obviously I'm not the right person to talk about that, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, there is some funding, there's not enough, um, but there are other ways as grants, innovation grants, um, there are probably alternative ways to, to, to find funding as well. Yeah, and we were talking uh, or listening rather at the panels yesterday, you know, how much funding there is, how yeah, successful people Slovenia is in, in, mm. in, in, in Croatia as well, in, in I mean, if you think about, say, interrupted, like only 1%, uh, at least that was the number now, it's probably increased uh, annually, only 1% of housing are new developments. Everything else already exists, and we need to improve that. So it, there's no other way around. Yeah, I don't know what the generation rates actually in other regions. I should look it up for my own panel. I saw 2% uh, a year. I don't know if that's 2% a year. 2% is in Europe, sustainable renovation. That was like kind of our target. <laughs> Probably it's not, but that's the target. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's nowhere near enough, right? So it's talking a lot about operational energy, okay, minimum energy efficiency, uh, but it is not only that, right? So so what we, resilience of the buildings, it's not only about um, being resilient to, to extreme uh, weather events, right? It's also providing comfort in prolonged periods of changed weather. So we know that the summers are getting hotter, the winters are getting colder, and we expect more and more <coughs> of our buildings. So we used to live in huts, but now we want our buildings to, to provide everything, including emotional uh, satisfaction, you know, ho you know, holistic sustainability. And, and Yasmin is really a leader uh, uh, in this arena. So Yasmin, could you tell us what's your plans want from buildings? Um, what is, you know, other than, okay, efficiency, fine, but what do they really want on top of that? I, as, as an architect and designer, for me, it's a combination of many things. You know, you try to 
create uh, very desirable places because they're not only desirable for people living in it, but for the value of a city, for the value of the real estate. Uh, I think it's, you have to look at it holistically. There's functionality, there's you know, energy uh, efficiency, but you also have to be uh, psychologically, emotionally triggered. I think it's a combination of all, and that's why the, the, there is the existence of architects and creative people. Um, I've been on a mission for a very long time. Uh, I've, with my office, we have researched sustainable materials for over 20 years. So, you know, realistically, the word sustainability is like almost overused in the last years. And, but it has been uh, kind of very urgent for decades, but you know, unfortunately it wasn't taken very seriously. And um, the thing is that there are so many materials that can replace the traditional building materials like concrete, for example. Concrete is uh, responsible for 8% of CO2 in the world. Uh, the, the construction industry is responsible for 40%, but 8% is just concrete, which is the same number as all the fashion industry, by the way, that's creating CO2. So this is one, uh, one of my you know, missions within my work is to see how we can uh, co you know, substitute concrete. Uh, so we have in our research found many materials that are bio-organic materials, uh, biomaterials that are coming from nature uh, that we have been exploring and they can be so much more efficient than uh, concrete. Uh, for example, the, the thermo, when we're also talking about energy efficiency, it has to do with how, you, how do you adapt uh, you know, the climate, especially in, with knowing that heat and, uh, is going to be a, a global problem. You know, we are getting more temperature, the temperature is, going, is rising. And uh, there are materials like hempcrete. We are also working on mycelium, which is the root of fungus, which is a very new, uh, you know, uh, discovered in the last few years. Uh, bio-organic, uh, you know, substance which is older than, than, you know, existence of humanity and even trees. They call it the network of the, of the universe, of nature. And um, we are not there yet in all materials, but we do have already materials that can replace in certain areas concrete and um, that have strength like concrete, but are much more, uh, you know, resilient and also uh, having completely, uh, are completely biodegradable and having, um, I mean, maybe you know, a few percentage impact on the environment. And uh, we, we are working with materials that clean the air, they're taking away CO2. Uh, we have this for facades, uh, we have it for, like in countries, like especially in the Southern Hemisphere or where you have a lot of heat, where you can use even carbon, uh, carbon fiber, which is sandwiched in and it can reduce the use of air conditioning within buildings by 30%. We already know that these materials, which like hempcrete is one, can uh, save 50% energy cost. For me, the, the main problem is ignorance and not enough knowledge. And it's also, I feel, the responsibility of architects and designers globally to educate investors, developers, uh, you know, real estate companies that we can do something. We don't need to wait. I mean, there's a lot of talk on all, you know, all over the world on, on ESG and and all the problems we know, but there's very little action. And I, you know, I would like to be more part of the action team. So what we do is we implement it in all the projects we are doing, which is from luxury hospitality, lifestyle hospitality, mixed use, retail, office, airplane, you know, cruise ships, <laughs> kind of very broad. Uh, and then also it's about really uh, understanding uh, from the beginning of the process, we. I think uh, maybe you talk a bit more about embodied carbon, but like where you start, you know, manufacturing it and uh, just the circular economy also means transportation. But uh, what is really interesting is that there are already materials. I mean, for example, one material in, in Italy, they have a patent where when you use these kind of ceramic huge slabs instead of granite or other building materials for facade, um, within maybe a year, you already have uh, offset the carbon uh, you know, dioxide that was produced for, for these materials and it starts cleaning the city. And as we know, the air pollution in many cities around the world is very high. Uh, so that can be something that can absolutely help it. Uh, there, we, we have materials that take away of allergy when you have pollens outside. And uh, you know, we also <laughs> designed lighting with Himalaya salt that is, is good for you know, allergies and also uh, vegan leather like from rhubarb, cactus or uh, apple skin. So there's so much um, 
that can be done. And it's really fascinating that there is so much around. It's just not really known. And I think for me, the exciting part is that it's also beautiful because, you know, we, we don't, it's a bit like when you think about organic food, when it started, people were thinking vegetarian food is really boring and, you know, it's, uh, it's not tasteful. Now you have also in London amazing vegan restaurants, vegetarian restaurants. You don't need you only this, but... So you mentioned um, uh, embodied carbon, and it is the next elephant I'm going to drop on, on me. <laughs> You're with me today on, on the panel. So it, it is really difficult, right, for us in, in an industry okay, to measure how much energy we're using. We have smart meters, but have reverb, but it's relatively easy. Um, but, you know, this whole life cycle carbon of a building, can you explain the concept and, and what, what are the elements and how you and your practice deal with that? Mm -hmm. um, so the embodied carbon of the materials within the building um, and then there is the operational part is the energy that you use while building is in the operation um, and then there's also an end of life cycle where what do you do with the <coughs> materials of the building when you know you don't need the building anymore demolition and so on so um, what, what we do we we make we try to make design decisions based on whole life carbon so a simple example probably double versus triple glazing. Uh, does it make sense to put triple glazing everywhere? Perhaps not, because triple glazing, there's another sheet of glass, so there's increased embodied carbon uh, to manufacture triple glazing. And so then you, you should run an energy performance to see how much energy can you actually save with triple glazing uh, versus double glazing. And does that pay off? So does that energy slash carbon in operation pays off for embodied carbon? And so we do that for every material. And uh, it's, I think it's, a, as you said, it's very, it's very exciting time to be an architect, especially a nerdy one, <laughs> because, uh, because there, there's just so much data. If you want to, like, insulation, again, in my favorite subject, so if you, if you think about insulation, we have the same U value, so same thermal transmittance um, of a wall, same performance. The embodied carbon can vary from four to 20 times more. So aerogel is like 95% air. So it has relatively low embodied carbon. Some natural materials have low embodied carbon, but then sheep wool, it has a bit higher, but then expanded polystyrene has really high embodied carbon. So just, you can have, get the same performance and even it could be the same cost, but you need to think about what is the embodied carbon of the material. And then natural materials also sequest carbon. So like trees absorb carbon while they were in the forest. That's reported separately from what we're talking about, but. But still, there's also that benefit. So you've been sequestering carbon. Well, you know, materials were in the forest, organic materials, but now they go into the building and they have relatively low embodied carbon. So they're essentially carbon negative. Um, so, so that's you know that that's the main um, I think about the embodied carbon, um, the, the 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 way of thinking uh, when designing for considering embodied carbon. But it's tough. Uh, it is to tough, that. yeah. I mean, the, I think the main issue is lack of knowledge. Like people, and, and it takes time to, to model this forever. First, lack of knowledge, you know, you, you need architects who are trained in sustainability, who have this knowledge that there are all these options and who looked into them, studied them and so on. Uh, but then there's also uh, time consuming mm -hmm. to model everything, to make sure you're making the right decisions. And, and Yasmin, you mentioned you are, you're creating a library of materials uh, uh, soon as part of that, you know, trying to educate people and, and give that knowledge um, uh, to, to wider public. Uh, so when can we expect that? Yes, well, uh, by, by the end of the year, uh, we want to launch a library for only sustainable materials for the design and, and building industry in order to make it accessible. Because there are so many you know, companies who have started to do innovation and they're all over the world. And again, according to where you have your projects, you should try to use you know, local suppliers, but there are some fantastic uh, companies and they're not visible uh, if you don't really put them all on, on one marketplace. So that's, that's the idea. Fantastic. So, Jane, the last one I'm gonna bookend with you. Um, so, okay, we're talking about the building you know, uh, as a point on the map, but your thing is the places. So how can the surrounding of the building help the performance of the building? Uh, you know, I've seen studies where you know, plant the trees in the yeah. streets, yeah. they're actually lowering the temperature in the street, mm. lowering mm. the urban heat pile, and, and you know, therefore the buildings need to work less. Right? Yeah. 
yeah. uh, to these blue-green solutions that are more mm. on an agricultural level. Um, <coughs> how, how would you look at that as well? That's a, a great question. Yes, I think you're right. It's an interaction between the physical building and its wider environment. And um, we, see, we see a lot of plans now which are you know, about the, either the building of new buildings or the refurbishment of existing buildings, but tied into how we, we're regenerating, environmentally regenerating places. And you're absolutely right. More green infrastructure, of course, has fantastic benefits in terms of climate, adapting to and mitigating climate, but also just enhancing things like mental health, for example. So the kind of socio-environmental benefits are fantastic. Um, and municipal authorities, government authorities, love to see this. They also love the developer to pay for everything as well, which is one of the challenges. Um, and maybe the developer should pay because everything around the building... It the value of the place. It does, absolutely. It raises value. And of course, we have this whole concept of land value capture, that you're trying to capture some of this um, if, increased value to, to pay for things and to to manage the environment and you know we see more flooding in cities Dubai was an extreme example last week but flooding generally in urban areas can be managed with more green infrastructure of course so it is a it is a combination and I think there's also always a slight tension between okay who's going to pay ultimately and who will receive the benefit ultimately and how can we share how can we share the cost and share the benefit between public and private in an in an equitable, efficient way that actually gets things to happen. I think, but um, you know, the financial benefits of doing these things properly and the economic benefits should be shared and should be be widespread. I just wanted to pick up on a, the the great points that Yasmin is making about new innovative materials, which and how we use them, um, which is fantastic to see all of these things like hempcrete instead of concrete. I mean, these are fantastic developments. And I think what we also need to see is, is how the market evolves in order to produce and supply these materials at an affordable um, rate so that they are actually used and implemented. And I think there's, this is maybe where the, the public sector and the government sector can play a role in providing an environment to scale up and to develop supply chain. Because one of the big constraints, I think, knowledge absolutely is a constraint, but it's also lack of supply chain and lack of skills, lack of workforce. And these things are all fluid, they're all evolving and changing at the moment. But I think if we want the regulations to really be utilised and do the things they need to do, there are these other extenuating things like skills, labour force, communication, information, supply chain that also need to be addressed. So a holistic approach. Yeah, basically, yeah. always. Overused word uh, for sustainability, but it does go, go well with I just want to highlight that, I mean, it's a great question because construction quality is so important and uh, going back to like passive house or inner fit, uh, the, the rate of infiltration of outside air is going to determine how energy efficient your building is. So we need to minimize the infiltration and that's connected to construction quality detailing and so on. Um, I, I mean, um, as a solution, I mean, one of the solutions we see in practice is if you, um, obviously, if you want to certify that helps because third party comes, they actually measure the level of infiltration or I mean pressure uh, on the facade and they then you know you won't be certified if you haven't achieved it. So that's kind of a must. And the other reason why it's important is because now that we are, let's say refurbishing, it's for the next 60 years, 40 years. Um, and you know, the cost is calculated based on, on this duration. The savings are calculated based on you know, the lifespan of a building and if poor construction is gonna shorten that then you know that that's a waste of money as well. So the checks yeah. and certification. Checks and certification is one uh, solution. Yeah. yeah. It's a great question. I'll answer two points very quickly. Um, investors, how to attract investors to the region? Well, investors will be attracted to anything where there's a high return on investment, of course, because that's why they exist. That's what they do. So I think there may, let's look at mechanisms to de-risk investment in the region or to part subsidize construction, maybe through use of EU transition funding or EU funding, which can help, I guess, Slovenia and Croatia in the first instance, and to adhere to new regulations. So maybe providing a better basis for that higher return on investment and encouraging the market to develop through these kinds of interventions, that's one thing. Const let's come back to construction, because that's absolutely vitally important. If you don't have a construction workforce, none of this is possible. We've just had a session which is all about brain drain, now, this is a huge problem for the region, losing um, losing people in the construction sector, going to places like the UK, 
So Albania, I have a friend here who's from Albania. The UK is full of Albanian builders. Great news for the UK because we can get all of our buildings fixed. Bad news for Albania. So it's, you know, how do we turn brain drain into brain gain? Because if you don't have a skilled workforce in construction, all of this is going to be extremely difficult, I think. Um, I think we are out of time getting uh, looks from the audience. So the third one, I think we take, we take to the floor and we can ask another question um, uh, in, in close quarters. Uh, but thank you very much for my fantastic panel. Thank you for the audience. Thank you.